Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. By now you probably know my name is Scott Miller and I serve as your ongoing host and interviewer each week. Today I'm excited to announce that we have one of the world's premier productivity organizing experts, Julie Morgenstern, joining us. And you may wonder, why is Franklin Covey bringing on an outside productivity expert, given that that's our own expertise? But what our clients know is that we like to be very abundant, and we think it's great for our clients to have lots of different perspectives, which is why we've invited Julie, who's collaborated with us on many occasions in past years, to join us today to talk about her newest book, Time to Parent, Organizing Your Life to Bring Out the Best in Your Children and You. Julie, welcome to On Leadership. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Scott. So delighted to have you, Julie. I, I kind of had some selfish reasons because as you know, I'm a fairly new parent. I have three boys, four, seven, and eight, which control my life and have kind of gotten me in the chaos mode. So I'm very excited to hear some great leadership parenting tips from you in our conversation today. I'm delighted. Hey, so let's talk first. I read in one of your blog posts or articles that you and I have a lot in common. You have a girl, I have three boys, but what we have that's similar is we both sort of had this managed chaos in our lives. We always were losing things and sort of discombobulated a kind of a big mess around us. We also always managed to kind of pull it out at the last minute. But I want you to share kind of your journey about what changed in your life where you had to seriously change your life and no longer kind of be a managed chaos expert. Yeah, sure. I mean, I did grow up a kind of notoriously disorganized person, um, always late for things, always losing things, um, but always pulling it off at the last minute, as you said. And then I had a baby. And pretty quickly, I figured out that though I didn't mind the chaos so much. And in, in many ways, I thrived on that chaos. It was exciting to me. I was a bit of a conquistador of chaos. Um, it was really not fair to create and wreak this much havoc on a child's life. And it, it all kind of started on, she was about three weeks old and she woke up from a nap and I wanted to take her for a walk. And it took me two and a half hours to pack and gather things and find things to get ready for the walk. And by the time I was ready, my daughter had fallen back asleep and I missed the moment. And I thought, I never again do I want my child to miss an opportunity because I'm not ready. And I think, you know, when you see something on the other side, the chaos that you want, and in this case, I wanted to be a good mom. And so I was very motivated to get organized so that my child would have the best chance at everything she wanted to do and everything that was available to her. Julie, there's a lot in your book that I want to delve into. One of those is a fairly comprehensive research study that you conducted around what types of parenting time do our children need the most? Would you open our conversation kind of dispelling some of the rumors and cons confirming some of the facts around as modern day parents, what do our children need the most from us? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's been that for years, parents are in this dilemma of is it quantity time or is it quality time? And how much is enough? And it always feels like no matter what we give, it's not enough, which makes it very hard to ever, you know, stop and take time for ourselves. We always feel guilty. So in the research that I did, I wanted to know how much time and attention do kids need to feel loved and secure? Because that's what we want to provide as parents. We all want our kids to feel loved and secure. How much is enough? And it's really not the quantity versus quality is the wrong question. It's, it's consistency is one of, the, one of the answers. But what I found, it was very liberating and that what children need and thrive on is short bursts of five to 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes tops, short bursts of truly undivided attention, not half in our phones, but fully focused on them, delivered consistently, not big blocks of time delivered occasionally. And, and kids have short attention spans. This is what I learned from my studies into the research. And many experts say to calculate about a minute of attention for each of attention span for each age of life. 
So a five-year-old has about a five minute attention span before they're ready to like do the next activity. A one-year-old, one minute, a 15-year-old, 15 minutes. This is a very liberating notion for parents, especially working parents who feel so guilty working that from the time they walk in the door at night until their kids are asleep, they feel they have to be all on all the time. No, it's short bursts delivered consistently built into the fabric of the day, all the sort of key anchors in the day. And then you can have together but a part time, you can have the occasional big blocks of time which might make memories, but it's the day-to-day -day, everyday moments when the kids wake up and they get together at the end of the day, dinner and bedtime, et cetera. That's where kids really thrive and know that they are secure, that they are important to you and they're loved. It's in those short bursts regularly. Julie, this, th this program really focuses on leadership topics, right? And there's a clear connection between, you know, parenting sanity and your ability to be a great leader. I was talking recently with Dave Ramsey, the, you know, the very popular radio host and prolific author. And we were talking about the exponential growth of his professional consulting business, companies hiring his firm to come in and teach financial principles to their employees, mainly because these organizations care about their people, but they also realize that a, an employee without financial stress is a much better employee. A leader without financial stress is a much better leader. I'm guessing your research and experience shows that the same exists when people have some calm and some purpose in their parenting life, they can bring their whole selves to work more effectively. Yeah, no question about it. And more and more companies today are recognizing that they have to address the whole person because that's who's working for you as a whole human. And we can only really do a great job at work and be fully present and give our all if we are not feeling like our personal lives are being completely neglected at the expense of work. And that balance that sort of fuels us, it fuels our creativity, it fuels our innovation. When you get to like turn off work at night, leave, uh, not feel like you have to be online until midnight and all weekend where you can never really be with your family when you're home. What happens when you're at work? You can't really be fully present at work either because you're thinking about having neglected your kids, not been able to really be present at dinner, not really being uh, able to, to, to give your all at home because of work. So leaders are finding more and more um, that if you cultivate and encourage and create, help give your employees the tools to create fulfilling home lives, they become much better workers and they last a lot longer. There's much higher retention because parents don't feel they have to choose between their job and their family. Their job is saying, we wanna support you in thriving at work and thriving at home. And people also will are more likely to take leadership roles. That's what we're finding is it's kind of hard to get people to take promotions these days yeah. because they don't wanna give up their personal lives. Right. And so if you can take a promotion, take more responsibility at work and know that your company honors and supports and is giving you tools to enjoy and be present and fulfilled at home too, you're much more likely to accept additional responsibility because it supports your whole life. Julie, you can imagine with three young boys that I read a lot of parenting books, as does my wife, Stephanie. This one I think that you've written, Time to Parent, is enormously practical. One of my favorite parts of the book is where you open and describe this concept you call the parenting time matrix. What I'm gonna ask my producers to do is to take you off video for a moment and put up this matrix and to have you kind of talk us through what its impact can be on parents. Because I found it sort of um, exponentially helpful, not just the time matrix itself, but the understanding of sort of when I'm in the adult world, when I'm in the child's world, and when I'm in sort of the visible and invisible world, would you take a few minutes to kind of walk through why this is so valuable to so many people reading the book? Sure. So we'll, we'll, we'll get that up on screen. So 
Look, parenting is, a, is the ultimate juggling act. And we as parents have to juggle a variety of responsibilities to take care of and raise kids. And for us, we may have strengths in some areas and weaknesses in the other. And um, it is very helpful to recognize that the different kinds of time that we spend as parents are perceived very differently by our children. It's not all the same. So I broke down the four things that we as parents have to balance our time between into four activities that really encompass everything we have to do. We have to provide for our kids. We uh, you know, make money, work, uh, pay for things. We have to arrange the logistics of our kids' lives. Where do they go to school? What are they eating for lunch? How are they getting home? What do we do on the weekend? We have to relate to our kids, which is get to know them as the unique individuals they are. And we have to teach our kids life skills and values so that they can survive and thrive out in the world. And it, while they all may feel the same like work to us, kids feel them differently. And I was always, both as a parent and as a coach and, and, and working with parents, always wondered about this very frequent phenomenon where you have parents who say, I sacrificed my entire life for my kids. And kids who say, those same kids will say, my parents were never there for me. And they're like, how can that be? Well, that's because some of the things we do for our kids take place in the adult world. Some take place in the child's world. Some of them are visible to our kids and some of them are invisible. And being aware of the distinction between those enables us to communicate, take care of our kids in a balanced way that communicates visibly to our kids how important they are to us. So providing and arranging, you can see in the, in the, in the matrix, provide takes place in the adult world, but it's largely invisible to our kids. They don't see us at work, they just know we're away working. Arranging takes place in our child's world. You're doing stuff for your kids. They have a lunch packed, they get to school on time. They have clean clothes. But when are we doing that arranging? It's not visible to our kids. Mostly it's at night when they're in school, after they go to sleep, they don't see the work. They just, and then relate and teach are both visible. So this is where we have that power. You wanna to communicate to your kids that they are important to you. You must spend time and relate and teach, but also recognize this. And I think for us as parents, this is a profound insight to absorb. Teaching and relate feel different to our kids. Why? Because when we teach our kids, we are bringing them into the adult world. We're in charge of the agenda. We're talking about teaching them things that we feel are important for them. And they are the students of us. But when we relate to our kids, when we get to know who they are, the unique people that they are, we have to actually enter the child's world and we become the student of the child. They're very different. And as parents, it's so easy to always teach and we do that out of love, but we have to make sure that we are spending time relating in order to even teach. Kids aren't gonna to listen to you if you don't feel, they don't feel they don't, we understand them. So those distinctions, and they can help you navigate and balance your time appropriately. We need to do all four, but they're not all the same. And so the matrix enables us to be conscious of where we gravitate, the things we avoid, and make sure that we are touching all four bases. Julie, I'm gonna become your biggest evangelist on this book because I think this simple but prophetic quadrant will change the way I parent. I, I find myself up in the upper left, you know, uh, valuing my own ability to provide for my children. But I also find myself sometimes berating them for how much time I'm spending up in that category and how little they care for it when they really want me down in the lower right. I'm guessing there's at least one other human out there that's like me. There I'm sure are. they're all better parents. Yes, and you know, the book has a self-assessment. We also have one online on my website. Um, that you can take to find out where your strengths lie and where you're sort of neglecting, not because you don't 
want to do a great job. It's just we we develop patterns to sort of either parent the way we were parented or in direct mm -hmm. opposition. Um, and there's the most common profiles are very high provide, high arrange. It's called a, like a, a doer, low relate, low teach. And a high provide and high relate is another one of the profiles, uh, but then there's no arranging and there's no teaching going on. So it's sort of like the best friend. And couples often gravitate toward like, you know, uh, complementary profiles, but you actually as a parent want your kids want you to relate to them, whether you're the mother or the father, whether you work or whether you don't, whether you're organizing beautiful meals or not, they want that relate from each of their caretakers. Julie, what advice would you give parents like me that find themselves on the you know, left side, mostly in the adult world, perhaps in the invisible side, that where I want to be, where my children probably need more of me as they age and the more I become a little more financially stable, hopefully, how do I change to move into the relate area more? Because that seems like something that my children are going to need from me. Any tips you would give us and me on how to move and spend more time in the relate area? Yes. And what does I that would, look like? I think it would look like build it into the key transition points of your kid's day. Every time you see your kids, when you, they first wake up, when you send them off to school, when you first walk through the door at night, at dinner and when you put them to bed, those five key anchors in the day, make sure you spend the first five to 10 minutes of each re-encounter, you're already there, make sure you spend that at relating to them. Ask them about their day, don't ask them about their homework or their chores. See how they're feeling, let your eyes light up. Ask them to explain the game that, you know, go and enter, they playing some game, let them teach you how to play the game. And remember, it's short bursts. It's very reassuring for parents to know that you don't have to spend hours and hours. You just need to spend the first moments and be fully present for them. And I recommend that before you encounter your kids, before I, I call it making a mindful transition, um, we, instead of just sort of bursting through the door and getting straight to the business of, We've got to get dressed. I'm going to teach you how to like tie your shoes or whatever it is. Um, make, a, make a transition in your mind and set your intention before you cross the threshold on what you want to communicate on the other side of that door, which is I'm going to relate first, then I can teach. I'm going to relate first, and then I can arrange. Then we can do providing. Relate first and let your kids know you love them. And if they want to spend time on things that you don't find engaging, which is actually a really normal problem that we have, like I had a client tell me she just, her kids wanted her to watch her skateboarding and she just found it so boring. They kept doing the same move for like a half an hour. And I said, don't try to enjoy the skateboarding activity. Focus on your child's engagement with that activity. Like you're the student of the child. What engages them? How determined are they? There's resilience there. There's tenacity. What are you learning about your kid as you're spending time on topics or activities of interest to them? It's a front row seat to who that child is. I asked for parenting advice. I think you just gave me marriage advice, which was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can do the same thing. Those first five minutes, they call it like the marriage saver. I when agree. And reunite at the end of the day. It's not, oh my God, I had the worst day, or oh my God, I had the best day. It's how was your day? Right. Always be focused on them first. And in the first five minutes, it makes such a difference. As you were talking, I was thinking about what a profound impact that would have had, not just on my children, but on my relationship with my wife as well, too. Uh, yeah, it, it's true. It's what we all need, right? We all just want to be loved and listened to and seen and recognized. And the fact that it can be done in short bursts of attention rather than big blocks of time is doable even for a parent working two jobs or 14 hour a day job. You can fit it in. It's strategic and very precise. Announcing here today, Julie's next book, Time to Stay Married. It's a great topic for you. Yeah. 
Julie, in the book, you also, in addition to the you know, parent time matrix, you have a corollary around sort of the, the, the self time matrix. Talk about yeah. the value of that and walk us through that, if you will. Sure. So in addition to the four things we have to do to raise happy, healthy humans, while we are parents, we also really need to practice and fuel ourselves, self-care. And parents always feel guilty about it. And they also feel, if, even if I wanted to, where is the time? And, but if we neglect ourselves while we are raising our children, we lose energy. We don't feel as motivated. We're kind of, we, we overestimate our ability to give to our kids without taking care of ourselves. And the fact is, Scott, I'll tell you, you know, each generation of parents in general tries to improve on the prior generation. And today's generation of parents are actually spending more time with their kids than any generation in history by a lot. So like since 1975, moms are spending a triple the amount of time with their kids than they did in the 70s. And dads are almost two and a half times. However, it's at the cost of self-care. They are doing that at the cost of sleep, marriage time, exercise, et cetera. So there are four activities that we must spend time on in order to fuel ourselves to be good parents. S-E-L-F, sleep, S is for sleep, exercise to stay fit and energized and healthy to keep up with our kids. L is for love, that marriage and our friends and our adult social circle that nurture us. And F is for fun, which is the hobbies or passions that just make us feel like us, which is such a powerful way to keep refueling your energy for the hard work, balancing parenting, working, all of the to-dos, you have to keep refueling yourself to go the distance. You know, Julie, this is an important topic because as I'm listening to you, I'm finding myself as a professional, as a husband, as a parent, right in the middle of this conundrum myself, right? I've just turned 50, I have three children, and I'm always balancing, should I be mowing the lawn or should I be playing with the boys? Should I be working or should I be playing with the boys? Should I be out you know, skiing with my friends or should I be with my boys? And I think I find myself sometimes looking at you know, some of people in my family, extended family, that are spending a lot of time on themselves. And I think, gosh, that's kind of selfish of you. Your, your children need more of your time. But they actually seem happier than I am because I think they don't neglect themselves. And I find myself kind of being a bit of a martyr and a victim. Any yeah. advice for people, mostly one person out there like me, that finds themselves you know, kind of giving up their life for their children because of either guilt or not knowing kind of the right way to parent and self-care. Any tips you might give someone like me on yes. what to do? Yeah, so I do think that you, you're you sort of onto it that if you're martyring, your kids are gonna feel it, number one. Two, you're not role modeling well. If you sacrifice your entire identity, your own identity, your own hobbies or passions or your adult relationships for your kids, not only are you unhappy and you're sort of operating on fumes, but your kids feel a lot of pressure. And they're like, oh, that looks like miserable to be an adult. All you're doing is working all the time. <laughs> yeah. You're not having any fun. You don't have any hobbies. And it's also a lot of pressure for them if you are their entire life, because that makes it hard for kids to leave and grow up and launch. They're like, oh my God, when I leave, my dad and my mom, they're gonna have nothing because I'm their everything. So the key, so really recognize your role modeling. You're gonna be a happier parent. You're gonna be a more creative parent. You're gonna bring a lot more to the table. That's to change the mindset. And then you wanna, once the mindset is there and you believe this, then you wanna change the mechanics. I think we make a huge error as parents. And once we start, once we have kids, we never change our approach to self-care. And we keep trying to do it the way we did it before we had kids in big blocks of time. So we think of exercise as that's 90 minutes, three times a week at a gym. And we think of 
our marriages and our friendships as long date nights or big blocks of big, huge ski trips, you know, every six weeks. And we don't have the big blocks of time once you're a parent. So we just abandon all self-care. But what if you changed your mechanical approach and you started building self-care in in small doses, delivered consistently, right? Hanging out with a friend, maybe not for an entire ski trip every week, uh, you know, every month, but you get together, you invite them over and you have families come over and you guys all hang out, the kids hang out and the adults hang out. Or you go out for a, a, a 20 minute walk or a half an hour walk, or you and your spouse don't need to go on date night if after the kids go to sleep, you spend 30 minutes not talking logistics, not talking about your work day, uh, but just really catching up with each other. Julie, what advice would you give parents on the most common mistakes we make that could, with some slight changes, actually be beneficial and show us immense reward? I would say one of, one of the things actually has to do with our addiction to technology. Technology has just pervaded our lives and more and more parents will either say there's no connecting time with their kids and they'll say if their kids are old enough to have devices, the kids are on the devices or kids will complain about the parents. So I don't think it's all or nothing. I think the goal is to synchronize screen time in your household. So instead of everybody just getting on devices, adults and kids, if they're old enough, um, whenever they feel like, create a docking station at the front entrance of your house. In the same way in the, like, the Japanese tradition, people take off their shoes at the entry and it becomes a sacred space. Do the same thing with technology and have a docking station. And then it's sort of like our focus is to be with the people who are geographically close to us, like in the same room, by separating ourselves from our devices for key points in the day, maybe over dinner, or maybe you know from the time you get home until the kids go to sleep, and synchronize that um, that screen time so that you're not ready to connect, but your wife is on her device and she's not ready to connect, but you're on your device. And that, that sort of cascading effect makes it where no one's ever available at the same time. So nobody spends any connecting time. Great advice. Julie, in the last couple of minutes, you talk in chapter six about four time management skills that everyone, parent or not, needs to master. I'm gonna pitch each four to you and have you give me a minute understanding on each. Fair enough? The first one, apply selective perfectionism. What does that mean? Well, that means that we have too much to do to be able to cover all the different bases, these eight different activities. You can't be a perfectionist in every area. You're going to get stuck in a quadrant. So you have to learn how to practice selective perfectionism. I teach a skill called max, mod, min. So for anything that you need to do that could take over your schedule, take over your day, take too much time, or you do it, ask, what's the maximum I could do on this task? What's the minimum I could do on this task? And what is the moderate I could do on this task? And then pick the one that's appropriate for the situation that day. And it gives you much more flexibility. It's not all or nothing. It's not fabulous or terrible. It's what level today under these circumstances am I gonna do? You talked about this next one briefly, but Number two is resist the siren call of technology. You know, easier said than done. Yeah, they, these devices are addictive and um, we need to become media mentors to our children and in our household. And it's sort of like the way sugar, you know, many years ago just sort of pervaded our society. And now we make guidelines like when we do eat sweets and when we don't, it's not before dinner, et cetera. We have to do the same thing with our technology decide what we use technology for and what we don't and when we use technology and when we don't. And there are guidelines on American Academy of Pediatrics has very up to the minute guidelines on appropriate use of technology at every age and stage. And I would read that as a parent. I, I need to because my, my seven year old, who's my twin, like my biological DNA twin, 
The first words out of his mouth when he wakes up are, Dad, can I use the iPad? No. And then he makes it to the kitchen, Dad, can I use the iPad? And he'll ask me 80 times during the day, and 77 times I'll say no. What advice, what parenting advice would you give me on how to better structure that? Because we're pretty good at saying no, but sometimes it's just like you give in because you're going insane. Yeah, he wears you down. So I would Oh, no, I'm worn that, down. I'm to enough, girl. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. It's exhausting. And just recognize it's addictive. So I would have a conversation. He's seven. He's old enough to have a conversation, not in the just in the moment. But sit down and say, look, technology is great, but it's very, very uh, addictive. And it's only one kind of activity. So we're going to make and define four other things that you can do to entertain yourself, to uh, have a good time that's fun and interesting for you other than technology. And technology is going to be the fifth choice, not the first. So he wants something to do. Oh, you're asking for the iPad or whatever. Go to one of the first four. Why don't you read a book? And But he will choose those himself. So you have to engage him in the alternative forms of entertainment so that he owns them and is excited about them. You're not just making suggestions in the moment. It's his own menu. Well, that would need to be like popsicles, ice cream, Twizzler bites, or Twizzler bites in order for the yeah, first four to there's work. The, there's the connection <laughs> which, between sugar and technology. <laughs> yeah, which I know, which I, I don't think my seven-year-old's gonna fall for that, but I'm gonna try that. Okay, so that's good, it's good advice. It's very sound advice. Number three is master mindful transitions. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about before. It is with all the eight things we have to divide our time between for our kids, for ourselves. They require different parts of our brain, different skills. And it's hard to switch between them. But we can switch between them if we make mindful transitions. So when you're at work, you're fully at work. And before you walk through the door at work, you want to make a mindful transition and let whatever happened that morning at breakfast, for better or for worse, go and set your intention before you cross the threshold for work. What is your intention for the day at work? You're going to be a great leader. You're going to be a great boss. You're going to be a great presenter at that board meeting. You're going to mentor your employees. What is your intention? Be present. And when you get home at the end of the day, before you cross that threshold, you pause and you set your intention for the evening with your family. What is it that I want to achieve tonight with my family? I want to show them I love them. I want to be present when I walk through the door. We're going to be tech-free dinner. Set your intention. And those mindful transitions, it takes five minutes or less before you cross a threshold will allow you to be fully present as you switch from one role to another, from the adult world to the child world, from um, uh, relating to teaching, you know, family time to self time. Very powerful. Superb advice on three. Uh, finish us off with the fourth tip, build a village and delegate. Well, parents do in this generation also really tend to try to do everything themselves and you can't do it yourself. And the best thing you can do for your own sanity to handle this massive workload is to build a village of other caretakers, of neighbors, of your community at your church or at your kid's school, a network of other adults and families that can provide logistical support and emotional support as you are on this journey to parenting. And it really lifts your ability to balance your time between all of these because you're not trying to do it all on your own. When you look at these, uh, the matrix and you look at the self-care, there's no way one human being can find the time to do it all. So you want to engage other people. And that really makes the journey doable, more confident, and it puts time back in your pocket if you build a village and delegate more. Julie, our time is ending, but I want to ask you a final question. You, know, yeah. you are a prolific best-selling author. You're a consultant trainer, keynote speaker. You've been in this industry for, gosh, 30 years as a productivity organizing expert. And through our mutual friend, Deborah Lund, you know, you've come back on this program and you are as relevant, perhaps more relevant today 
than you were in your debut 30 years ago. What career advice would you give to people on things that you've done in, in an industry that has you know, seen a sea of change? What advice would you give people on how to keep their careers as relevant as you have? It's a compliment, but it's, it's a true assessment of your, of your brand. How have you remained so relevant over three decades? I would say there's probably two things. Number one, no matter how much writing I do and speaking I do, I have a coaching practice that keeps me completely connected to what is going on for people on a day-to-day -day basis, year-to-year -year basis, through good economies and bad economies, on technology booms, et cetera. So I, st I have it, that's my lab, even though it's my practice. And that keeps me very current. And the second thing is I've always maintained a curious mind. And as things change, and Lord knows it has changed a lot, and there's so much more to learn, right, in, in, in this age of work, I jump in with a, a curiosity to understand and conquer the new so that I'm not left out in the cold, number one, but also it's stimulating. It's a chance to expand my mind. So as things change, if I can learn, I'm expanding my own brain power. And that keeps me relevant. It's, it keeps the brain alive like Sudoku, except it's a more relevant application. Julie, thanks for your time. More importantly, my three boys, thank you. Hopefully someday. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've fixed me a little bit. We appreciate you being a guest today uh, on Franklin Covey's On Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. And just start tomorrow. like it, doesn't matter how old your no, kids are. No, I'm going to start are. tonight in about 45 minutes. I'm going to start today. Yeah. yeah, it's never too late. I think that's the most important thing for everybody who's listening or watching is, you know, you hear this and you're like, oh my gosh, my kids are eight or 14 and I wasn't there. I was all provided. You can start tomorrow because the heart truly, every heart just wants to connect and every human wants to be loved and listened to. You do that tomorrow, you're going to see a very rapid transformation. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to be much more mindful of how much time I'm spending in my world versus my boy's world, what's invisible, what's invisible, how am I relating to them, these five kind of bursts of time throughout the day, being mindful of, you know, when I walk into their room, am I talking about me or talking about them and listening, understanding. So I've learned a lot. I, I, I really appreciate your generosity today. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, we hope you've enjoyed the conversation. We hope you are a better parent, better uncle, better aunt, better caretaker. Uh, many of us feel like parents in the workplace, but I think a lot of these principles are valuable for our friendships and our marriages and on our teams. I'll bet you, you can digest and transfer a lot of this into your role as a daily leader. We hope you enjoy the On Leadership series. As always, it's available not just through our weekly subscription newsletter, which comes out every Tuesday via email, complimentary, on Leadership is now the world's fastest growing digital newsletter. If you aren't subscribing, visit franklincovey.com, click on the On Leadership tab, and each Tuesday morning we will send you this video interview, also in an audible uh, uh, version for um, uh, podcast as well, as well as a blog that I write and a tool to download each week. We also push it to every podcast channel as well. We hope you become part of what is now the fastest growing leadership conversation around the world, sponsored by Franklin Covey. I'm Scott Miller, and we'll see you back next week with a new guest. Thanks for joining.